a leading advocate of women's issues, was on campus this evening. Good evening and welcome to News Center at 9.30. I'm Melissa Cordial. And I'm Julian Grace. Gloria Steinem spoke before a packed house this evening. Our Patricia Van Artsdale was there for the presentation and joins us with more. Patricia? This year marked the 15th anniversary of Women's Week at Ball State. The university has been trying to lure women's activist and writer Gloria Steinem to speak on feminism for five years. Steinem's speech, entitled Feminism 101, covered the advancement of women's social equality over the past few decades. Before she went deep into her speech, Steinem said her goal was for everyone seated in women's auditorium to leave with new ideas. use all of us who are here in this unique combination. I need your help in overcoming this, this old-fashioned structure we have here. Steinem finished her speech with a Q&A and a book signing session. Steinem mo is most known for her books on feminism and her role as editor and co-founder of Women's Issues magazines. Julian and Melissa. Thanks, Patricia. You can read more about Gloria Steinman's presentation in tomorrow's edition of the Ball State Daily News. Also in tomorrow's edition, Marty Burnell, the wife of President Blaine Burnell, that's Ball State's President Blaine Burnell, gives her opinions on raising a feministic daughter. These stories and more in tomorrow's edition of the Ball State Daily News. This afternoon's Cardinal Job Fair brought 101 companies to Ball State. This number is down from last year when more than 130 attended. The slow economy may make it hard for students to find jobs. New Center Allison Bell has more. Tennis shoes for high heels at today's Cardinal Job Fair. With the economy in a slump, employment is harder to find. Only 101 companies came to the job fair as opposed to last year's 128, says Career Center's Karen Spizak. The September 11th tragedy has had a lot to do with um, kind of the hiring market for this year. The decline in companies and positions available makes students uneasy about finding a job. Definitely nervous about finding a job. Some advice for Ball State students in search for that dream job includes attending all job fairs. Reporting for News Center 43, Allison Bell. There is one more job fair during finals week for education majors. Over 100 school corporations will be on campus to discuss employment opportunities. And uh, Wes Klein is in with a look at today's forecast. What, Wes, what do we have going on uh, today as far as weather? Is it going to, I noticed that the snow is melting. Is that going to continue? Yes, the, the late March uh, thaw is on. As uh, tonight's forecast, we'll be, have mostly clear skies tonight with a temperature of uh, 24 degrees and a southeast wind at 5 mile per hour. All right, that doesn't sound too cold. Thanks a lot, Wes. Thanks. And the Build Indiana Fund is going to lose more money. Two Republican State Treasurer Tim Barry and Auditor Connie Naas have agreed to follow Governor O'Bannon to transfer $247 million from the Build Indiana Fund to the General Fund. The governor needs the funds to solve the budget deficit. The controversial Build Indiana Fund provides money for state legislatures to fund local projects. Election officials all over Indiana are trying to figure out how to get more people to vote in primary elections. And one high school senior is also doing his part, something nobody has ever tried before. Here's New Center reporter Dustin Grove. At first glance, Justin Reitz is just like any other high school senior. What up, Jack? Looking forward to graduation. I'm headed to Milligan College in Tennessee. Looking forward to the future. Yeah. Hoping to play soccer there. But before all of that, if all goes to plan, Justin's future might involve time here at the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office, only not necessarily behind the bars. I'm running for Hamilton County Sheriff. Um, basically just because I really want to raise voter awareness. Barely 18, no law enforcement experience, not even a high school graduate yet. And Justin Reitz is on the ballot for sheriff of one of Indiana's fastest growing counties. Hopefully uh, the young voters will take interest and actually uh, care about the candidates and come out and vote. Not exactly the way most would do it. And there are various other ways by helping campaigns, um, helping candidates. Um, helping at the polls. I thought that this would be a way in which um, other 18-year-olds and first-time voters would actually just um, pay attention to the election. Voter turnout has been down lately. Countywide, it was 18%. Um, That's pretty low. That's pretty low. Do you think it's going to work? So far, it has. So far, I've gotten a great response from everybody here at the high school, at least. Did you register yet? But from the public? I'm not sure he realizes what all he would be getting into. Do you think you have a chance of winning? <laughs> um, you know, I, I almost hope 
to a certain extent, I don't have a chance of winning, um, just because I hope that the other kids will take an interest in it and vote for the candidate that they think is best qualified. And if Justin does become the new sheriff in town? <laughs> um, if I were to win, I think I'd have to deal with it then. Um, I am not prepared for that right now. Uh, I don't know what I would do exactly, but if, if and when that time comes, then I'll have to deal with that then. Either way, it's going for the record books. Dustin Grove, CNN Student Bureau, Carmel, Indiana. We'll be sure and let you know what happens in that election. A man who teaches young people how to care for horses has been charged with animal abuse. Lake County Animal Protective Services of Merrillville, Indiana, says a horse in Arnold Dwell's care starved to death. Dwell is a stable owner, and he says a veterinarian examined the six-year-old Arabian horse two weeks ago and found nothing wrong. Dwell says he doesn't know what happened to the horse. Animal services expect charges for improper shelter and feed to be filed against Dwell. A man convicted of producing methamphetamines has agreed to demonstrate how to make the, a drug for how to make the drug for a videotape aimed at teaching police officers about the dangerous process. The plea agreement requires Rodney Flora to help produce the videos before his guilty plea is accepted by a Vigo Superior Court judge. Police say the methamphetamine that Flora makes for the video will be destroyed immediately so it does not fall into the wrong hands. Coming up after the break, an Israeli hotel was the target of another suicide bombing. And President Bush has comments on the events of the Arab summit. Also, U.S. troops of the, on the USS Roosevelt have returned to the Norfolk, Norfolk Naval Base. Stay tuned. At least 19 people are dead and more than 130 people are injured after what the Israelis are calling a Passover massacre. The suicide bombing occurred today in the lobby of the Park Hotel in the coastal city of Netanya. The hotel was crowded with Israelis who had gathered for the traditional Passover meal. The Israeli government says it will respond using self-defense. An Arab summit, summit began in Beirut. Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat decided not to attend because of restrictions, threat, restrictions threatened by Israel. The Palestinian delegation walked out in protest of the summit after Arafat was not allowed to address the summit by satellite. The summit is attempting to address the escalating Israeli-Palestinian conflict. U.S. US citizens could be the targets of U.S. citizens could be the targets of terrorist attacks in three Italian cities. A U.S. embassy in Italy has credible evidence that extremist groups are aiming for America's, Americans in Florence, Venice, and Verona. A State Department official believes that facilities where Americans are known to congregate may be targeted. Today's announcement is the second such advisory about U.S. citizens in Italy since September 11th. State Departments worldwide caution all Americans to remain alert. Crowds of happy people welcome troops home in Norfolk, Virginia today. After more than six months at sea, the aircraft carrier USS Theodore Roosevelt is home from its tour, from its tour in the war on terrorism. Eric Phillips is at the Norfolk, Na Norfolk Naval Station. Well, after more than six months at sea, the sailors of the USS Theodore Roosevelt are home and the celebration is beginning. Not a moment too soon, the USS Theodore Roosevelt reached the pier in Norfolk. Not a moment too soon, sailors reached the arms of loved ones. It was a long wait, but hi to everybody at home. We love you. E2C Hawkeyes touched down at Naval Air Station Norfolk on Tuesday while F-14 fighter jets arrived at Oceana and Virginia Beach, both coming from fighting the war on terror. It's an opportunity to exhale and smile as more than six long months of separation come to an end. This has just been really great to have him home. From the time the USS Roosevelt Battle Group pulled out for their scheduled deployment on September 19th, sailors and their families knew this trip would be anything but regular. No more exercises or drills. Operation Enduring Freedom would be a real war with real casualties. An ever-present reminder, the rubble flag from the World Trade Center blast. It flew over the Roosevelt during this deployment. It was returned to New York City firefighters during a special ceremony Tuesday on board the ship. We knew we were safe out at sea. We felt pretty secure, but we didn't know what kind of changes were going to be happening here at home. 
Now the sailors are back at home so they can see for themselves how home has changed since they left. At Naval Station Norfolk in Virginia, I'm Eric Phillips. Back to you. In a town near Paris, France, eight people are dead and 20 are wounded. A gunman opened fire at a late night city council meeting earlier today. CNN's Jim Bitterman has more. So it was after one in the morning when a French fire department cameraman recorded this scene as the injured and dead were taken out of the city hall in the Paris suburb of Nanterre. Minutes earlier, a gunman now identified as a regular spectator at city council meetings suddenly stood up and methodically began shooting the members of the city council. A deputy mayor described the scene. We were about to leave, then suddenly the man stood on a chair and started shooting. And then he moved and shot toward where the council was sitting. He did not say a word. It lasted some minutes. He targeted everyone. Police identified the accused gunman as 33-year-old Richard Dern, who local residents said was a gun collector with permits for the weapons he carried. Because several of the 19 injured are in serious condition, it's possible the death toll could go higher. The attack came as voters have been saying crime and security are the most important issues in the French presidential election campaign. Candidates Lionel Jospin and later Jacques Chirac both visited the scene in the Paris suburb, along with numerous other politicians, all of whom offered their condolences and concern for the crime wave that has swept the country in recent years. Almost unnoticed in the aftermath of the shootings here was another telling story of rising crime near the French city of Malouz, where 30 members of a gang overran a police station trying to free three of their fellow gang members. In the end, police were able to hold on to their prisoners and regain control without injury. But all of it brought an immediacy to the presidential campaign and will no doubt further public demand that politicians from both the right and left give more than lip service to the need for a crackdown on crime. Jim Bitterman, CNN, Nanterre, France. Arthur Anderson has come up a loser with New Jersey casinos. The State Casino Control Commission has voted unanimous, unanimously to force casinos and their parent companies to sever ties with Anderson by May 15th. The regulators say public confidence in Atlantic City casinos would be undermined if Anderson was allowed to keep working as a casino industry vendor. Last year, six casinos did a total of $2.1 million worth of business with former Enron CEO Arthur Anderson. British-born actor Dudley Moore passed away this morning. Pneumonia and a complication resulting from an incurable degenerative brain disorder claimed his life. Moore played in the films Arthur and Ten, to name a few. He was 66. 93-year-old comedian Milton Berle also passed away in his Los Angeles home this afternoon. Berle has been diagnosed with colon cancer about a year ago. Yesterday, East Central, yesterday, East Central Indiana received three inches of snow. Today, but it's melting today, that's right. Around, around 1 o'clock today, the high temperatures reach 34 degrees. Wes Klein is here now. Now, Wes, will that snow go away? Yes, after that three inches of snow we received yesterday, the spring is making its return. Stay tuned after the break, and I'll have your forecast. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the spring thaw is underway, but our temperatures still remain below normal. Today's high was 35 degrees, which was still well below the normal of 53. Today's low, today's low was a chilly 19 degrees, and as the normal low is, is 34 degrees. Here's the high temperatures for today. As you can see here in Muncie, we're at 35. As in the northern part of the state, you can see they were in a 37 in Fort Wayne and Lafayette, 37, as they stayed warmer to the south with less snow, slow, uh, snow cover. Uh, time, of the, uh, time of this year, we need to watch the, as the snow melts, the rivers start to climb. Right now, it's, it's, doing, it's doing all right as the East Fork White River in Columbus is 5.5 feet, and the White River here in Muncie is five feet, and the Wabash River down in Terre Haute is at 8.5 feet. Currently, outside, the temperature is 30 degrees with, under mostly clear skies with that northeast wind at six and the humidity is 70%. Here's the satellite image shows a, a little bit of, of high clouds here over at the Hoosier State. As our next weather system here, 
it, up in the Dakotas will be moving toward, towards us tomorrow night, giving us about a 40 to 30% chance of rain. Right now, the radar you can see is relatively clear over the region. As tonight, you can see this high pressure system is giving us those, those clear skies. And, and as this cold front pushes through, it'll give us that chance of rain tomorrow night. As you can see here on tonight's lows, I'm calling for a temperature around 20, 24 degrees. It is, is, uh, it's warmer to the south with uh, the warmer temperatures. Tomorrow's highs, I'm calling for 50 degrees right here in uh, Muncie as, uh, as the colder temperatures are persist, persisted up north. Tonight, that the mostly clear skies will have that temperature of 24 degrees, that southeast wind at five. And tomorrow, you'll start, the day will start out with uh, some sunshine and then the clouds will move in with a temperature of 29 degrees when you wake up. As you can see, our temperatures will rise a little bit from this warm front as it pushes through the area. But as this cold front pushes through tomorrow afternoon, it's going to give us that slight risk of uh, showers persisting in the afternoon and late evening hours. So as you can see, the increasing clouds tomorrow with that rain chance coming in late tomorrow evening with a high of 50 degrees. And as you can see here on a three-day, the Friday will be a temperature of 54. Uh, Saturday will have a temperature of uh, 49 and sunny, sunny, partly sunny skies on Sunday with uh, 42 degrees with lows ranging in the mid 30s. So it looks like a pretty, pretty nice three day outlook ahead. It's nice to see that things are warming, warming up again. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see the snow continue to melt. Yeah, that's true. Thanks for that report, Wes. Yeah, thanks. Now Margie Zihar joins us now. IU is headed to Atlanta for the Final Four, correct? Yes, they are. What are their chances? Just... Oh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I, it just depends on if Tom Coverdell's ankle is okay. I'll have all the news on IU. Plus, we got room on the bench at Ball State for another player. Someone's transferring. I'll tell you all about it when News Center at 930 returns. Men's basketball team has room for another player on the bench. Junior guard Zach Willingham says he will transfer for his final, final year of eligibility. His reasoning for the leave is lack of time on the playing court. Willingham transferred to Ball State this year after two years at Allen County Junior College. He is currently looking at California Poly State University. He averaged just under two points and one rebound per game. And students from Indiana University are gearing up and heading to Atlanta for this weekend's Final Four game against Oklahoma. The team is at Assembly Hall this week practicing with guard Tom Coverdale's ankle still in question. Some Ball State students had thoughts today about this weekend's game. Yeah, uh, Oklahoma, I really haven't seen them play much, but I think they're like more of a defensive team and they've got some real, a lot of power with them, so it'll be a pretty tough game. Well, if they can shoot the three-pointer like they did in the last game against uh, who they play, uh, Kent State. Yeah, I think they could probably win if they come out with that much intensity. They could probably win the ballgame. Yeah. IU faces Oklahoma Saturday night at 6.07 p.m. And with the college season ending, some players are starting to think less about school and more about the pros. Michigan State sophomore guard Marcus Taylor declared himself eligible for the 2002 NBA Draft Tuesday. He becomes the third sophomore in two years to leave. Guard Jason Richardson and forward Zach Randolph both left after their sophomore, sophomore seasons last year. Taylor led the Spartans in scoring at 16.8 points a game and 5.3 assists a game. And today, Mississippi State forward Mario Austin has decided to return for his junior season instead of going to the draft like was thought. Austin was considered a potential first-round draft pick. And the Indiana Pacers lost to the Pistons last night, but still have the eighth and final position in the playoffs by two and a half games. But the fight is the real story. Jermaine O'Neal goes to the basket over Corliss Williamson, and then things got out of control. O'Neal was suspended today for two games without pay and fined 10 grand by the NBA for throwing punches at Williamson of the Pistons. Williamson was not suspended, but has a fine of $5,000 for throwing the 
ball at O'Neal's head. Shown right there. Not good. And the New York Jets quarterback Vinny Testaverde had surgery today to remove a benign bone tumor on his right foot. The inch-long tumor was found about two weeks ago. Testaverde will be on crutches for about a month, then will begin rehab and hopes to be ready to play when training camp starts on July 27th. The 38-year-old QB threw for over 2,700 yards and 15 touchdowns last season, leading the Jets to the playoffs. And the sisters will meet yet again. The sisters of tennis, Venus and Serena Williams, are meeting again in the semifinals of the NASDAQ 100 Open. Eight-seeded Serena defended two, defeated two-time champ Martina Hingis, shown here in two sets, 6-4, 6-0. The two women from Compton most recently played each other for the U.S. Open crown, where Venus won the first Grand Slam final between siblings in 117 years. And, you know, that was it was a really good match. I remember watching it back in the fall. And, you know, I think this one should be a good match. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be pretty exciting. Thanks, yeah, Margie. Thanks. And Wes Klein is in with a one last look at our final forecast. Yes. Oh, after the break. Well, coming up, well, he'll have your final forecast after the break. Stay tuned. Clear skies tonight, that low temperature of 24. Tomorrow, the sun will be in the morning with a high of 50 and the clouds coming in late. Nice three days on tap with the temperature of 54 on Friday and nice forecast going right into the Easter weekend holiday. Thanks, Wes. And nice. thank you for joining us for News Center at 930. I'm Julian Grace. And I'm Melissa Cordial. News Center 43 is an official CNN Student Bureau. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for News Center at 530. Good night.